Good afternoon. I'm Tom Bradby and thank you for joining us for this RTS Christmas special. As you can probably tell, I'm here in the ITV News studio where I'd usually be presenting News at 10. But today I'm taking you on a whistle-stop tour of the political treasures in our archive, from the speeches that shaped history to the most probing interviews. Since ITN's launch some 65 years ago, some of TV's most memorable political moments have played out in front of our cameras. And in my 30 years in the job, I remember quite a few of them. I'm not quite sure what that says, but that's a subject for a different time. If that all sounds a bit serious, fear not. It is Christmas after all, and this is a chance to sit back, grab a mince pie, and listen to my special guests as they pick out their key moments and share their anecdotes in a year that has to rate as one of the most significant ever for both the media and politicians. I'm pleased to welcome the Right Honourable John Whittingdale, Minister of State for Media and Data, Times Radio presenter, stand-up comedian and ex-Labour advisor, amongst many other things, Aisha Hazarika and Jed Mercurio, writer of the hit TV shows The Bodyguard and Line of Duty, amongst others. Thank you all very much uh, for being here. Now, we all knew 2020 was going to be busy with Brexit and then Trump up for re-election, but none of us could have been prepared for what followed. It's even spawned a new phrase that may be with us for a while to sum up anything that's just a bit rubbish. It's very... 2020. The pandemic was a hard crisis for politicians to grapple with, uh, no question, with few easy answers. What they got right, what they got wrong will be something for the historians to argue over, of course. From our point of view here, there has been the sobering responsibility of a renewed reliance on broadcast news. Many channels have seen audience figures surge since the pandemic. So, John, maybe could I start with you? This has been a remarkable year in so many different ways. From the point of view of us in the media, I mean, effectively, we're in a kind of massive public emergency, almost sort of like a war. Big audiences, big pressure to get it right, a uh, big kind of public duty to explain everything. What do you make of the interplay between the media and politicians over the course of this year? Well, I mean, this has caused huge problems for the media themselves. So I've been very involved in talking to the broadcasters, the radio stations, to the newspapers about the impact on them. But at the same time, there has been this extraordinary surge in demand for news, um, audience figures for news bulletins, Tom, yours, I'm sure, and, and everybody else's have absolutely rocketed. Um, and we've seen huge audience numbers figures that we haven't seen for decades of people watching news bulletins and, of course, the major announcements like uh, the Queen's two public statements as well as the Prime Minister's regular bulletins. Aisha, it's been, you know, there's been a an argument for a while that we were trending towards a world in which broadcast news wasn't so important, we were going online, things were happening online. It didn't really feel like that was true. It felt like we went massively in the opposite direction this year. What did you make of that? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Look, you know, social media is still very important in the mix and there's good things and there's really bad things about social media. But I think as these, again, cliche alert, as these unprecedented times hit, what I think people thirsted for was a return to a more traditional way of consuming news. And certainly the desire for trusted narrators on uh, the news, particularly um, on, on broadcast. And what I thought was fascinating is how politicians themselves used television as such an important medium to communicate. We had these Downing Street press conferences about the epidemiology and the science, and people were absolutely, you know, glued to them. Um, and they, you know, the, the viewing numbers were, were high and people thought they were really important. So I think, you know, in some ways it's been, uh, it's been good, you know, the, the broadcasters have had a good crisis. There is a but to this. Um, one of the other things, though, I think we have seen is a bit of a breakdown in trust um, between politicians um, and the sense of accountability. You know, they, there was a while when things were going pretty badly in the pandemic, when government ministers didn't want to go on um, lots of TV shows and, and radio shows. And I think that was something that, that also, I think, came up this year. I think that's now that trend is kind of shifting a bit. But it's been very interesting. Definitely, this was the year where I, for me, I really felt that like broadcast, um, be it TV or radio news, was was back. 
Jed, can I ask you, you're a relative outsider to the interface uh, between the media and politicians, and indeed you have to draw on it uh, for your fiction, which I think is always a fascinating thing to have to do. It's not actually necessarily been an easy year for either side because it's such an unusual circumstance and working out what the right tone for us to strike, for example, has been quite tricky on occasions. What have you made of it? What's your assessment of how both sides have handled this sort of really unusual set of circumstances? I think the pandemic has intensified problems that were already there. And I think uh, John and Aisha have, have already covered that ground in terms of the accountability of politicians and the reliability of news services. So the fact that we were in the middle of a public health crisis where tens of thousands of people were dying only accentuated the, the desire of the public to get straight answers from politicians and the frustration sometimes being taken out on the journalists. Sometimes the public were blaming the journalists for failing to get a straight response from a politician or in one of the coronavirus briefings. Can I just ask you a question? I think a lot of people watching will be intrigued over. You use politics, or you use certainly politicians, certainly in the bodyguard. Obviously, there was a political element to that. Uh, you know, and I don't know, I know you've been writing the next series of Line of Duty. Maybe we'll talk about that in a minute. But I don't know what you're specifically writing now. But for a writer, I mean, do you ignore... If you're writing something that was topical, if you were writing another bodyguard now, would you kind of ignore coronavirus, pretend it wasn't happening because it'll be over by the time you're at? How do you deal with the current reality and would you use any of it in your fiction? I think it depends what the subject matter is within the fictional work. For example, in Bodyguard, we decided to completely disregard Brexit. And the reason for that was just that there was no um, overarching prediction of how Brexit was going to go. In, in fact, many of the people that advised us said Brexit would be done and dusted by the time Bodyguard went out, and that was 2018. So um, I, I've kind of learned to be a little bit cynical and, and to think that sometimes if you attempt to um, seize topicality, you can just end up with egg on your face. Predicting how Brexit is going to go, we're still, we're str still trying to do that here. If you find an answer, please do let us know. Now, there will be plenty more to discuss regarding coronavirus a little later, but now it's time to open up the archives, starting with speeches. Prime ministers, party leaders, politicians, their words have the power to change all of our lives, and, of course, their own. From rallying calls to resignation speeches, victory celebrations to war declarations, the oratorical skills of our political leaders can also determine their own failure and success, and sometimes it's not even what they say, but how they say it. Go around the country and you will see such a state of prosperity as we have never had in my lifetime. I shall be called the Iron Lady for daring to voice these things. I have the good fortune to be the first liberal leader for over half a century who is able to say to you at the end of our annual assembly, go back to your constituencies, and prepare for government. Time to get back to basics and not shuffling off on other people and the state. Ask me my three main priorities for government. And I tell you, education, education, and education. We will give the British people a referendum to stay in the European Union or to come out altogether. I do so with no ill will, but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. Now, as somebody who has spent an awful lot of his life listening uh, to political speeches, I am kind of fascinated with them. John, as a politician, maybe we can uh, start with you. You've made speeches, you've listened to speeches, you've advised politicians and leaders about speeches. Uh, you see some of the speeches there and a kind of development of them. What makes a good speech? Is it the style of delivery? Is it the content? Is it capturing a historical moment? I think it's all those things. I mean, the really memorable speeches, some are memorable because of the occasion on which they were delivered. I, I spent 
um, five years nearly working for Margaret Thatcher before I was elected. And one of the jobs I had was helping her with her speeches. Um, two of the ones which I will never forget, one before I started working for her was the one she delivered the morning after the Brighton bomb, which was a statement of defiance that democracy would prevail and that she wasn't going to be uh, deterred from delivering that speech in Brighton. And then the other was the one where I was, I was involved, which was the speech she gave uh, immediately after she denounced her resignation. Um, but also, good speeches need memorable lines. You, you showed quite a few of the ones which have passed into history. They also need humour, um, and that was something also which I tried to help Margaret Thatcher with, but um, I also subsequently worked for William Hague, and his great strength was he made people laugh, and a really good speech was memorable if it contains humour, which is also political, um, and that was something he was an absolute past master at. We, we forget about how funny Haig was, actually. He could be very, very funny in speeches. It's one of my memories of him, actually, as a speechmaker. But as, as somebody, forget for a moment... That, well, actually, let's include the speeches you yourself have made, but also those you've advised others about making. Do you know when you've got a great line? I mean, are you, are you surprised when something hits, or do you know when you read it, nah, that's well, you, the line you, we need? You write speeches um, with the hope that at certain points, you will get a strong audience reaction. And certainly working for Margaret Thatcher at that time, we used to write in what we regarded as clap lines, and we would actually advise her, you know, stop and pause here, let the audience applaud. And, and usually it worked. Sometimes you got it completely wrong and it was sort of deafening silence. Uh, and sometimes it was unexpected. But it is very important that you take account of your audience reaction uh, and give them a chance to voice that reaction. OK, I just want to play a couple of uh, sound bouts now, Aisha, oh, particularly for you. I think ones that we, we are not uh, going to forget. Maybe I could ask you afterwards to pick up on some of the Blair classics. It's no good trying to comfort ourselves with the thought that automation need not happen here, that it's going to create so many problems that we should perhaps put our heads in the sand and let it pass us by, because there is no room for Luddites in a socialist party. The people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain. A day like today, I mean, it's not a day for sort of sound bites, really. Um, we can leave those at home, but I feel, the, I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder in respect of this. I really do. This is not a day for sound bites. I feel the hand of history on my shoulder. That is my all-time favourite sound bite, I think, by any politician. Aisha, sound bites, how important are they? When I was a special advisor, we did actually used to joke when there was a big kind of cliche <laughs> moment would be like... <laughs> This is no time for sound bites, and someone would put a big hand on your shoulder. That was like a sort of code, code in the office. But the thing about Blair is you look back on it now, and a lot of it is is does feel quite quite hammy, but it completely worked because Blair, along with Alistair Campbell, who was his right hand man, director of communications, they did really understand the importance of a sound bite. They understood the rhythm of a sound bite and um, the fact that you know it had to be short succinct you did have to leave a bit of a pause at the right time you had to sort of act it which feels very unseemly um for politics because you know politicians like to think of themselves as very highbrow and, and not really you know not concerned about you know presentation but that's a lie they are really concerned about it their staff and their team are really concerned um, about it because you know you can write reams and reams of of excellent um intellectual words but often it will just be a sound bite that is the thing that gets clipped. And that's the thing that gets your man or woman into the front room of millions of, of, of voters. Um, so the sound bite is, is important. And, and Blair, I mean, in some ways, Blair and Campbell almost sort of, you know, they relied on it so much. There was that whole kind of era of, of new labor um, spin where it was almost kind of like overly polished, but that is what all politicians do strive to, to do, even if they sort of pretend 
to be a bit, you know, oh, I don't care about it. It's not that important. Whether you're preparing for prime minister's questions, whether you're preparing for an interview like with Andrew Marr or whether you're preparing a conference speech at the absolute heart of it will just be like one line that you really hope will will kind of capture the mood and will take off. Jed, have there been moments when you're sitting at home watching a political speech live or clipped on the news where you think, oh, let me in there. That is so badly written. I could do a much better job. Is there a bit of you that would quite like to be a political speech writer? Maybe you, maybe you have written some non-fictional ones I'm talking about. I think it's fascinating watching speeches and how they've changed over the years. I think that we are so accustomed now to speeches being repeated over and over again. And that's just something that we see across all broadcasting, that things have um, a, a kind of longevity that maybe they didn't have before. So I think in the way that when you're writing dialogue for uh, a, a TV drama, you have one eye on the trailer. If you can boil the premise down into one line of dialogue, it's exactly the same. It's the, the politician knows that maybe the speech isn't going to be broadcast in its entirety. So in order to access that, that way of, of getting the message out to the public, it has to be boiled down into, into just a few words. So I think that once again, there's been a synergy between broadcast news and the business of politics. Well, this is a perfect moment to have one of your fictional speeches. I really don't care what you all do when you switch your internet browser to private. We're not after you if you type into your search engine B-O-O-B-S. But we ought to know if you type in B-O-M-B. There it is. There's your soundbite. So what's in your mind? I mean, are you essentially, when you sit down to write that, trying to think exactly as a speechwriter in real life would be? Yeah, and, and also um, in terms of the interview, the, the scene um, before on, on the Mar show, it's about just sort of picking up the, the, the language that's in fashion. One of the things that's really become um, such a, a, a go-to expression now in politics is, is using the adjective clear. So when, when a politician is answering a question, they'll often say, I've been very clear, or the prime minister has been very clear, and then they go on to avoid the question. And, and that's something that we kind of did adopt and, and use quite frequently for Keely Hoare's character. Um, I, I think it's really about trying to create some kind of very similitude, M making making the dra drama sound authentic, even though, obviously, it's completely made up. When I was political editor here at ITV, um, I think almost every speech I listened to by the end, uh, you used to play speech bingo in your head, particularly if the leader had been leader for a while. I could I could recite Cameron's speech bingo and Brown. But anyway, it's a, it's a slight segue. One of the, the issues, of course, uh, is how much personality you put into a speech and to what extent a speech is a reflection of your personality. So let's just take a look at a couple that really spring to mind. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> the ladies not for turning. <laughs> if Parliament were a reality TV show, then the whole lot of us, I'm afraid, would have been voted out of the jungle by now. We'd have had the consolation of watching the speaker being forced to eat a kangaroo testicle. And... John, maybe I can ask you about that. A classic, really, from both of those politicians. You know, Lady Thatcher, a really memorable soundbite that actually summed up her whole political character, even now, perhaps one of her most memorable soundbites. You know, B Boris essentially doing the one thing uh, that he, he does that few others can match him at when he's on form, which is to just, you know, sit there and make the audience laugh. I have to say, his speeches, I find, you know, some of them very funny and some of them you spend a long time waiting for the jokes he can be a bit patchy but you just talk us through particularly the lady thatcher one i mean that absolutely was a moment wasn't it that captured her personality in a speech 
It was, and it is one of her most memorable phrases. But in actual fact, and this is where perhaps there is a role for Jed uh, in modern speech making, that particular line was written for her by a professional playwright, a great guy called Ronnie Miller, who uh, used to help her with most of her speeches. But he came up with that line, and not only did it en encapsulate the message, um, it also was funny, and it, on top of that, it had the great strength that it was the double hit. You got the applause with the first line, you turn if you want to, and then she followed up with the ladies not for turning. And so you got two bursts of applause. But it, I have to say, it, it was written by a professional, um, and Ronnie was a, a great friend and a wonderful uh, advisor to her. Boris's speeches are all Boris's own work. Um, I mean, I, do, I don't directly help Boris, but I'm not sure he needs any help. And, and the clip you gave was absolutely classic Boris. Uh, and so, I mean, I think he relies on his own natural humour. Um, and, you know, yes, occasionally it may not pay off, but most of the time he's very, very funny. Aisha, what do you make? You're a, you, you know, you're a stand-up comedian, amongst other things. What do you make of, a, of the Boris Johnson speeches you've seen over the years? I mean, what do you make of his... I would say, having watched an awful lot of them, sometimes they are funny, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they look like he's put quite a lot of effort into them. Sometimes it looks like he wrote it out <laughs> on the back, uh, you know, with his hand in the taxi on the way there, which I suspect is sometimes true. What, as a Stepping aside from all politics and just assessing him professionally as a speech performer, if you like. So I think Boris does actually function quite like a stand-up comedian. And I think he's very good when he's in his comfort zone. And um, his comfort zone is really being his, you know, kind of mischievous, playful p personality. And he that's what he likes doing. And that's what we've seen from, you know, his conference speeches before he became leader of the Conservative Party. He was famed on the after dinner speaking circuit and many people actually saw him do the same sort of routine over and over again. But, you know, there's no shame in that. That's what a lot of stand up um, comedians do. What I think is fascinating about Boris Johnson's evolution of oratory is since he's got the thing he really wanted, since he became leader of the Conservative Party and since he became prime minister of this country, I think his oratory has struggled because he's not in his comfort zone anymore. He's trying to sort of be two people. He's trying to still sometimes be the clown and be funny, but he's also been plunged into this very, very difficult situation um, with a lot of responsibility and, of course, the very serious issue of the COVID um, pandemic. And I think sometimes he's struggled to, you know, decide, you know, which voice is going to come out. And I think he sometimes struggled with this, the more kind of sober prime ministerial um, voice that's had to come out that is by its nature, it has to be less jokey and irreverent. And I, so I think that's been quite interesting watching that, that evolve. And I think he struggles with speeches that have clearly been written for him. He doesn't have the kind of natural zest when he's delivering things. So I think he performs best when he's performing his own words and he can sort of get let be let off the leash, if you like. But that is very hard when you're prime minister. John, can I just ask you quickly what your view of that is? Do you think there's some justice to that? Uh, and that, you know, the Boris, the off the cuff, amusing the crowd Boris Johnson was perhaps more natural than the kind of sober national leader? Or do you think uh, that, that he manages that pretty well? Well, I mean, I think Aisha is absolutely right that Boris relies on humour, um, as a lot of successful speeches must contain humour, but it's, it's difficult to be humorous about something as serious as COVID. But Boris still uses very typical Boris lines to deliver his message. So, I mean, typically, most recently, you know, something like it's the season to be jolly, but also to be jolly careful is a very Boris line. It certainly is. All right. Minute by minute, hour by hour, politics plays out on our TV screens, in our newspapers and online. Every update is now shared within seconds and there's an agenda for every audience. But occasionally there are those political moments that make each and every one of us stop, look, listen. The events that shift the political landscape and change the course of history. Then a few days ago came the entry of Israeli troops into Egypt. Was it likely to lead to a widespread flare-up in the Middle East? 
in the judgment of the government, it was. Just your rejoice Pardon. at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to night, gentlemen. More? But it was as Mrs. Thatcher stepped forward with Dennis that the composure almost broke. Welcome to election 97, the results programme on ITV. One of the great moments in British post-war politics. Labour will form the next government. A new dawn has broken, has it not? Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied, Nick Clegg? Uh, I'm afraid I did oh, once. Right. I'm, I'm, uh... <laughs> Clearly, we are in the territory of making history here tonight. Um, those of us who've been covering politics a while um, thought that this might be the biggest night we'd ever covered, and certainly in the 26 years um, I've been with ITN, I've never seen anything uh, like this. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day! From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Well, there we are, some historic uh, moments. I have to say, one of them, um, not necessarily my version of it being historic, was on the Brexit night referendum. And it's quite interesting, actually, when you're presenting those long programmes. As the night wears on, you, are, you do begin to find yourself thinking, right, I've got to try and characterise this, and you're quite tired by then, so you've got to find the words that crystallise this, not necessarily in a moment, uh, but in something that is, I suppose, you almost start to think, uh, not quite in sound bites, but in you, your own version of trying to summarise this. Uh, Jed, can I just ask you, you know, you will have seen growing up many moments that perhaps stick in the mind. Uh, do you find yourself inspired uh, to some degree by watching a really historic moment that captures something? I do. And the reason for it is that you're seeing something play out that's authentic. And, and as a, a writer who tries to, as much as possible, set his work in the real world, then that kind of gives me a guide to, to the way in which public events might occur, uh, might be models for the, the kinds of events that I'm attempting to dramatise. Do you find yourself think when you're writing something, you know, you're obviously thinking into it. Do you sort of consciously try to think of the events you're writing about as real in order to make it easier to write speeches, to write interview scenes, to write these? Because it's presumably quite difficult. You're creating, I mean, certainly the bodyguard, for example, just to pick one example. You know, there were moments when you were watching that where you, it was almost like it was happening. It felt very real. It felt very realistic the way you constructed things. And presumably, as you're writing, you're really trying to think in, right, this is a moment... This is a moment of history. I think that's right, Tom. And, and the way we went about it was to try and invent as little as possible. So, for example, we had real news presenters doing the voiceovers as much as possible. We had um, real feeds from news studios, the, the exact environment that you would see if those events were, were happening in real life. Laura Koonsberg at Millbank with, with Big Ben in the background talking about um, what was happening in Parliament that day and so on. And so if you put enough of that in, then it, it allows you to create this, this kind of veneer of authenticity that, that allows the audience to suspend disbelief. I think it's very hard, actually, a lot of the time to portray news on TV. I think it, it, it often looks fake when you, you ask actors to do it, when you do it in a studio that, that isn't quite right, when the graphics are obviously a fictional news service and so on. Uh, John, Anthony Eden's Suez Address was one of the kind of first of its kind. How do you think that set the tone? And do you think the tone for a kind of national address, a big moment where the Prime Minister may be looking down the barrel and addressing the nation, has that changed perceptibly? And if so, why? Well, in a way, I mean, I think the, the coronavirus pandemic has, has brought back the very serious address to the nation from the Prime Minister. And I, th I think there is a public expectation that the Prime Minister will talk directly to the people at a time of national emergency. Uh, so, you know, in a sense, what Anthony Eden started back in 1956, we've, we've seen the, the, the sort of modern day version of that with some of the statements that the Prime Minister has made uh, to tell the nation why we are having to make such serious uh, measures as we have taken. 
How do you think they've landed? I mean, I've, you know, with those moments in which Boris Johnson was looking down the barrel and addressing us, I'm not sure I'm going to... They do stick in the mind. I don't know even myself whether they stick in the mind because he delivered them well or he got the tone right or just because of the gravity of the circumstances. You think of the first lockdown. I know we always overuse the word unprecedented, but it was just such an extraordinary moment that none of us ever thought we lived to see, you know, basically all being told to stay at home. Do you think he did adjust quite well or was it just the, the, his, the, the historic nature of the moment? Well, I mean, I think he, I think he delivered it well, um, but obviously it was such a serious time, um, and what he was having to tell people was so enormous um, that it was bound to stick in the memory. But of course, alongside him, you you have made national figures of, of two people who probably never expected to be uh, on TV at all, let alone household names. In that being Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty. Aisha, you've been in the middle of some of these events, you know, politicians rising, politicians falling, politicians being under incredible scrutiny. I mean, are you aware when you're living through it, this is a moment? Is the level of pressure very intrusive, very upsetting, very difficult uh, to live with? Are you consciously trying to work out how to frame a public narrative or are you just lost in the kind of, you know, the weeds of the moment before you? It is very high pressured when you're working for a very um, senior politician who is in the limelight all the time, who is often having a difficult time. You know, when I worked for Ed Miliband, when he was leader of the opposition, they do say in British politics famously that the worst job in politics is being leader of the opposition. Um, and I'm sure every single leader of the opposition will, will agree with that on, on all political sides. You are under so much pressure. You are conscious that every day could be the day when a mistake becomes, you know, a sort of a, a career ending gaffe or a government ending gaffe, or you worry that this might be the moment when the history books are written, that this is when the election was lost. So, you know, or, or won. So the stakes are incredibly high. And I think one of the things which is really hard in modern politics, particularly because of social media, and we don't even, we used to have one news cycle a day. It feels like we have three or four news cycles a day just with the speed of everything. You're trying to sort of keep on top of everything. You're trying to do everything. You're trying to make sure that your politician discharges their their um, duty. But you're right, you are also trying to frame a, a public narrative and possibly a historic strategic narrative. And, and that is really, really, really hard on all sides of politics. And I think sometimes you know, as commentator or when you haven't been in the eye of the storm, everyone's an armchair general about how they would, would do it. But actually, when you're in the heat of it, it's inc it is incredibly pressured. It's hard mentally. It's hard physically. You need to be so resilient from a physical point of view and, a, and an emotional point of view as well. I do feel actually the last five years has just been one massive political moment after after the other. Brexit, Trump, huge uh, changes and fascinating for it. But let's move on to perhaps uh, the most contested space of all. Interviews. They are media savvy, professionally trained and primed with their pre-prepared scripts. Sometimes they repeat themselves a lot. So it takes a dogged and determination interviewer to get a politician to abandon their well-rehearsed lines and deliver that news-making moment. But do we sometimes go too far? Well discussed. The art of the political interview has evolved over the decades. What began as a positively polite exchange between politician and journalist has become a much more challenging affair. It may seem incredibly polite by today's standards, but Robin Day's rigorous interview style with Prime Minister at the time, Harold Macmillan, set a new tone and standard for broadcast interviews. How do you feel, Prime Minister, about criticism which has been made in the last few days, in Conservative newspapers particularly, of Mr Selwyn Lloyd, the Foreign Secretary? Well, I think Mr Selwyn Lloyd is a very good Foreign Secretary and has done his work extremely well. If I didn't think so, I would have made a change. But I do not intend to make a change simply as a result of pressure. I don't believe that that is wise and it's not in accordance with my idea of loyalty. Is it correct, as reported in one paper, that he would like, in fact, to, to give up the job of Foreign Secretary? Not at all, except in the sense that everybody would like to give up these appalling burdens which we try and carry. Would you like to give up yours? In a sense, yes.
I, I love that. It's one of my favourite political uh, interviews. John, I think I must start with you. Robin Day was considered a daring interviewer at the time. Um, how significant was this for the style of future political interviews? How much was he groundbreaking? And where do you think we are now, if I can ask you to put, put your view on the line on the state of political interviews? Well... I, mean, I suppose Robin Day was perhaps the first to, to drop the incredibly respectful attitude which previous political interviewers always adopted, particularly when talking to the Prime Minister or some very senior figure, uh, and to ask a, a rather more direct and aggressive question. But personally, I mean, I, I, I lament the loss of the really in-depth, long political interview. Um, in the 80s, you know, to give one example, Brian Walden's show, uh, Weekend World, which lasted for a full hour, he would devote the entire of that hour to a single interview. Um, and I several times helped Margaret Thatcher prepare uh, for a, a Walden interview. And we don't have that kind of in-depth interview any longer. Um, even, you know, during an election campaign, you wouldn't get as long an interview as that. And normally it's, it's just a few minutes. And, I mean, Andrew Marr is a very good interviewer, but he doesn't have that long to quiz his guests. Um, and I do think that we lack something as a result of that. Funnily enough, um, you may not remember, I, after, I did this when Cameron's book came out. I did the sort of first TV interview that went with it. And I sort of worked with a team of four or five of us first to read the book and then to debate uh, for really hours how best to approach the kind of half an hour, 40 minute interview. And I was aware that it was such a long time since I'd had the privilege to do that, to really think about how you're going to tackle a politician. And you know the politician is preparing just as rigorously for the interview, working out every line of attack that you're going to have. And you're looking to get a chink in the armour. It's, it's like a rather fascinating uh, game of chess. But, John, can I just ask you, do you... Are you sort of happy with where the political interview is? I mean, it's generally got more aggressive over the years and there's a big debate about that. And, you know, personally, I'd say sometimes there's a scope for the more challenging interview. Sometimes there's scope uh, for the more relaxed interview. But generally speaking, do you think the political interview is in good shape? Well, I mean, I don't object to an aggressive interview style. I mean, I think if you're in public life, you have to accept that. And so somebody like Piers Morgan, who has been very challenging in terms of some of his interviews in the last few months, I think is perfectly entitled to ad adopt that critical attitude. Where I do worry is that in some cases, it appears that the interviewer is more keen to trip the interviewee up often by bringing up something which is not the main issue of the day, but to resurrect some um, question regarding some past behaviour in the hope of getting some sort of embarrassment out of the guest. I, I don't think interviewers should set out to make their interviewees look bad. They should, on the other hand, probe and test um, the opinions that have been given to them. Well, it's an interesting challenge for us, I guess, always. You know, in our minds, we're always trying to think, what would our audience want us to ask? What would they think is reasonable? But let's go on to a kind of different interview now, which I think showcases uh, perhaps the whole nature of having a personal relationship with the interviewee as well. Uh, let's look at Michael Brunson and Margaret Thatcher in 1991, the first interview after her resignation. Well, could I just, first of all, ask you to recall what must have been a very difficult meeting of the Cabinet. Yes, Bernard... of course it was. Of course it was. You don't take a decision like that without it being difficult, without heartbreak. Heartbreak there may have been, but it was the right decision. But you had to get through it. Bernard Ingham, in his memoirs, has said that it was a traumatic experience. Those are his words. Yes, it was. And it would have been very strange if it hadn't been. But we got through it. In fact, you broke down. We got through the house. You broke down during that cabinet, didn't you? Yes, but I carried on. And then the house? By that time, I was back fighting fit, as you saw. Just before that, though, the image that people will perhaps remember, as you said, the cabinet was extremely difficult. And then you had to come out into Downing Street, and you had to face the cameras. Mm -hmm. In effect, you had to face the world. Mm -hmm. You had to come and make what was perhaps the statement of your life. And then mm. I see that 
you know, we notice now that it's affecting you now, and it must have been yes, the most Yes, it's not affecting difficult. my voice now. It's not affecting my voice. You're thinking back to traumatic things. Um, but I managed to get through them. I managed to get through the television. I managed to get through the cabinet. Again, because there was something else to do. Now, I was Michael uh, Brunson's producer just after that and certainly uh, knew him to be uh, at times capable of conducting uh, a very challenging interview. But he took uh, quite, a, I would guess, a low-key tone there. Aisha, how much of that was uh, Michael Brunson's technique? How much of it was his relationship with Margaret Thatcher and allowing her effectively the space to become emotional? Or would any interviewer at that moment and any interview style have elicited that response? No, I think the fact that they obviously have a relationship and, I mean, she is obviously incredibly um, upset and, and why that footage is just so extraordinary is because it's very rare that you see that side of the Iron Lady. You know, we, we see her, you know, in her full sort of regalia. We see her, you know, the, the lady's not for turning. We, we, it's very rare to see her in that. So I think that's a, that's a kind of a, a collision of a, a, a trusting relationship but he also judged it well because there was no need to go in hard because you know it his 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 sort of approach elicited a very human very raw very interesting um response from her a very historic response and i think sometimes with political interviews less can be more i mean i always remember when when as an advisor when prepping uh, ministers and politicians for interviews in some ways, the, the Jeremy Paxman or the really tough interview, yes, it was brutal, but you sort of knew where the battle lines were drawn. Sometimes the really tough interviews were the softer interviews, the sort of sofa interviews, where a sort of a question could kind of come out of nowhere and, and the politician's guard would be down and they would be a bit more emotionally open and then something else could could often come out that was unintended. So sometimes a slightly softer approach can, uh, can actually be quite an emotionally intelligent approach. Jed, we'll come to fictional interviews in a moment, but you've, you know, as an outsider, I guess, to politics, you've seen a million political interviews. What do you make as of the state of the political interview generally, if I can ask that uh, very sweeping question? I think it's in a terrible state. Um... I think it was so interesting watching Macmillan and Day. It was a conversation. Macmillan answered the question that he was being asked in a conversational way. And to an extent, the, the Brunson-Thatcher was, was a conversation. But what we have now is uh, the real frustration of, of watching two people who were speaking cross purposes a lot of the time and the pandemic has, has really accentuated that it was so frustrating watching the coronavirus briefings and ministers being asked direct questions about PPE and testing and all they ever said was that those things were being ramped up I was sick of hearing politicians talking about ramping up and not dealing with what was going on in the present um, and I, I imagine most of the public felt the same. So I think we're in this, this quite um, tricky situation now uh, for the public, which is um, the, the style of interview may be being leveraged against access. So we do have politicians avoiding the tougher interview. Uh, I, I certainly agree with, with what... Uh, John and Aisha have said about sometimes a conversational style can elicit more revealing answers than, than being confrontational. Well, this is an interview. Let's just play you something now that is not uh, in the least bit uh, conversational. Um, half the battle can be getting the interview in the first place, but Jon Snow didn't have to worry about that in 2003 when Downing Street's communications director, Alistair Campbell, turned up unexpectedly at Channel 4 News' studio and demanded to be interviewed amid allegations the government had sexed up the dossier on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. The answer to the question, yes or no, 
did we abuse British intelligence? The answer to that question is no. We it don't is a know. Serious the answer to that question excuse is me. we do not excuse know. Me. And the reason we do not know is that there is obfuscation and diversion, part of which we're seeing right here played out before us. The fact is MPs want to question the chiefs of the intelligence services and should be allowed to do so. Instead, you're preferring, you, the government, are preferring a hole-in-the-corner operation. John, can I ask you, is that, the, you know, this was, let's not forget, public temperature, the public temperature was running very high. Uh, there was a lot of aggression around. The interface between the media and Downing Street had become very aggressive. Uh, but that was really an indication of quite a modern style of interview. I think frustration on John's part that he felt he wasn't getting an answer, frustration on Alistair's part that, you know, his words were not being taken seriously and the rest of it. When you look back at now, do you view that period as quite a turning point? And do you view that as a sort of appropriate type of exchange? Well, I mean, I think Alistair Campbell, of all people, is, is quite capable of, of defending himself. And so I think Jon Snow was perfectly entitled to adopt an aggressive attitude uh, back towards him. And as you rightly say, I mean, it was a, a febrile um, state at that time with very strongly held views on both sides. Um, yes, I mean, I think that it did represent a shift. Uh, and you are seeing that style of interviewer um, now much more. So, I mean, I, I mentioned just now Piers Morgan, who has been equally aggressive in terms of some of the questioning of ministers that he's undertaken. Um, but it may be that one of the consequences of the COVID crisis and the Prime Minister's direct briefings is a, a shift in the way in which governments present, uh, which has perhaps a step towards the American way with the appointment of Allegra, your former colleague, um, as now a public face of the government to give daily press conferences. Our esteemed former colleague, and it is, uh, it has to be said, going to be fascinating to see how she handles this very, very new role and whether it becomes a kind of British version of the West Wing. Now, we talk quite a lot about fictionalising. I would think writing a political interview, given everything we've said, uh, given everybody's expectations about what an interview should and shouldn't be, writing that, I imagine, is quite difficult. So let's just take a look at this uh, from The Bodyguard, where the Home Secretary, played by Keely Hawes, uh, is, of course, interviewed by by Andrew Marr, played by Andrew Marr. Home Secretary, just how anxious should we be about this terrorist threat? Is there another one around the corner? We are a target. We can't be complacent. Now, I am committed to supporting our security services by giving them greater powers to confront greater threats. Yeah, I'm not sure Andrew Marr nailed Andrew Marr there. <laughs> Jed, talk us through that. I mean, did, were you tempted to just say to Andrew Marr, look, here's the politics of this scene, play it, play it how you want, or did you think, no, no, he needs to have his lines? And maybe you could just talk us through your approach to that. Yeah, I mean, it was discussed with Andrew, and, and um, because it was a, a, a fictional political issue, um, he needed to be briefed on that, and he needed to know what the... the um, basis of each question was so in in the same way that you might explain um hidden parts of the story to an actor it was it was the same with andrew and he was just very keen to 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 follow the script particularly out of fairness to keely because keely had learned her side of the um the interview and had to perform so i think one of the the, the best forms of um interviewing is kind of the invisible type of interviewing where the afterwards people don't remember what the interviewer did they remember what the interviewee did and that was that was definitely the um the objective there but then and andrew kind of bubbles with so much personality it's uh it, it's pretty hard to keep him quiet okay well let's uh Lighten the tone a little now and move on to the, and finally, politics can provide endless material when it comes to comedy scandals, punch-ups, cover-ups. It is all great fodder, of course, for satirists and sitcom writers, but the politicians themselves, well, they often don't mean to be funny. What's almost certainly the first election campaign ever to be conducted from a hovercraft? John Preston.
Prescott immediately swung round and landed a punch straight on his jaw. Where we've got to have cones, they will only be there for safety reasons. Hello, is I was holding for the um, motorway road cone hotline, please. Well, it, I'm sorry, Caller, but it's shut at five. It's shut at five? Yes. John Gummer is convinced that beef and beef burgers are safe to eat. It's not often the chance to get some. <laughs> <laughs> It's a disgrace! Good to see you all. Good to see you. Whose idea was that? Bigoted woman. Thank you very much. Right. <laughs> very David Cameron. Aisha, I think I should begin with you. Ed Miliband, poor old Ed and that wretched bacon sandwich. You know, Ed, George Osborne was pictured eating a hamburger no better at something else the week before and, and absolutely didn't get hauled over the coals. Uh, I mean, we like to laugh, but those moments can be so damaging, can't they? And they're largely framed uh, when a media is hostile. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was an absolute... Um... It was an absolute nightmare. And I remember, I, actually, I don't think I was with him that day, but I remember just getting the message on my phone and just looking at the pictures, which just were pinging around, not just the country, but the world, and just, like, head in hands. Just, this is just, this is just... I mean, it shouldn't be awful. Like, person-eating sandwich should not be a sort of career-ending or an election-ending moment. But it, it kind of did feel like that. But as you say, it was the symptom of a, of a really kind of hostile climate. And as I said earlier, you know, being the leader of the opposition is always a really tough job. You saw there um, Neil Kinnock's famous moment on, on the beach as well. And quite, quite, quite a lot of Labour moments in there, actually. It's like, I think there's a, the, the Labour Party attracts quite a lot of these um, moments. But look, they are the things which you, 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 you plan so hard as a press officer and your team goes out and your comms team. And when you go somewhere, you always have these sort of things you've got to look at. So never have your minister sitting underneath a sign that says exit, for example. You know, there's loads of big, but you, you just can't account for, for everything. And sometimes, you know, if, if the wind is against you politically, and particularly if the media have got it in for you, then I'm afraid any opportunity to make you look like an absolute plonker is going to be um, taken. And it is sadly part of the job, but it is it is tough. The worst thing was, is shortly after that, Ed had to go and do a big speech in Parliament to what's known as the, you know how they have the White House Correspondents' Dinner? This is like the Westminster's version, except everyone's got a lot, like their teeth are like much worse than the Americans. And poor Ed had to sort of do an entire speech in front of all these people and eat like a and eat like a four course meal in front of everybody and he was so stressed about it and we were just praying there wasn't like linguine or something like that but it was fine it was it was food that you could all cut up and put into your mouth in a reasonably easy manner thank god <laughs> john as a politician yourself do you live in fear of these moments i mean you can't you can't predict how they're going to play out that's the trouble you know boris johnson gets caught on a zip wire which would be career ending for lots of politicians but somehow it just seems to absolutely make him you know neil kinnock full over, you know, on a wave he couldn't possibly do anything about and it's used against him. Do you live in fear of them or do you just have to roll with the punches? Well, I mean, I think there are two, two kinds and you illustrated both in that clip. I mean, there's the inadvertent disaster like Boris finding himself suspended in mid-air and not moving. And, and Boris, being Boris, did make the most of it. Um, and actually, I don't think he did him any harm at all, and, and people still laughed at it. I'm not sure John Prescott suffered that much from throwing the punch. But then you had the deliberate um, act which just plays really badly, and I don't know who the press officer was, but the person who thought that you could inspire confidence in British beef by having John Gummer feed his daughter a beef burger, um, that was not one of the greatest ideas, and um, I'm afraid it has haunted John Gummer ever since. Jed, I mean, there's a good point here. Boris Johnson doesn't get harmed by getting caught on a zip wire, zip wire despite looking transparently absolutely ridiculous. John Prescott doesn't get harmed by punching someone, which you would think would be career-ending for a politician, really. But I suppose everyone just thought... I mean, didn't Blair say, oh, it's just John being John, you know? Um, at least that's what most people, I think, thought at the end of it. Is there a logic to you to how some of these moments play out? 
Yeah, I think it depends what character trait it reveals. So I, I think if you take Prescott, it was kind of that he's a, um, a guy from a working class background. He's, he's experienced uh, uh, an assault. Someone's basically kind of fronted up to him in a really aggressive way. And he's, he's retaliated. And, you know, if you look at, at some of the others, I think it's, it's where someone shows um, quite arrogant traits, quite, quite reckless traits, whatever it is. So the, the Gummer one was, it, it just failed on so many levels. It just made you think that the, the, this guy was just a complete idiot. And um, I, I think if a politician can weather one of those moments, and, and particularly if they do it with, with a sense of self-deprecation, they're prepared to laugh and humanise the moment, it can sometimes enhance their reputation with the public. OK, I think we probably better wrap it up there. Just before we go, Jed, can I uh, ask if you can give us any hint as to what to expect from the next series of Line of Duty? I feel I have to ask since you're here. <laughs> um, well, that's a very good example of the soft interview technique, which we've ruled <laughs> into giving lots of spoilers that will then embarrass the BBC. Congratulations, Tom. OK, thank you. I love the way you neatly segued like a professional politician. Well, that brings our journey through the archives to an end, I'm afraid. I hope you've enjoyed our look back at TV's most memorable political moments, or some of them. No doubt there'll be plenty more to add by this time next year. I hope not. I hope 2021 is like the quietest year ever. I think we could all uh, use it. Thank you to our guests, John Whittingdale, Aisha Hazarika and Jed Mercurio, and to all of you who've joined us this afternoon. I hope you have a very safe and happy Christmas. Goodbye. Thank you for watching.